फोर थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव नाउ गुड आफ्टरनून एवरी वन ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ Asia Pacific Science Society Online Education Committee. I, Dr. Vishal Kundani, welcome all the delegates who are participating in this meeting uh, to to join us for the first webinar of 2023 on this bright Sunday of the 26th February 2023. So this is the first webinar of the basic webinar series. We are going to have four of the, three of them this year. Apart from the basic spine surgical webinars that are going to happen under the AGs of prestigious Asia Pacific Spine Society, we are also going to have three advanced online spine webinars again in this year in alternate months. The program of which is also available on the official website of Asia Pacific Spine Society. I welcome you all to join us in this intriguing spine webinar series. Three of them basic and three of them advanced to satisfy the interest in all of them. i take this opportunity to welcome all the faculty members from different parts of asia pacific spine society we have a star studded uh, faculty from japan from malaysia from singapore from bangladesh and india live as of now we have delegates joining from various parts of asia pacific spine society and other continents as well without much ado may i welcome you all to the first basic spine webinar of 2023 with the theme basic spine surgical techniques in deformity surgeries may i have this opportunity to welcome the president of apss professor dato dr mun kon kon to please deliver the welcome address professor kon yeah thank you uh, visha uh, on behalf of the apss i would like to welcome all of you to the first basic spine Uh, APSS webinars of 2023 series. Um, this webinar is a continuous uh, effort, educational effort that put out by the Asia Pacific Spine Society, all right, for uh, spine surgeon as well as orthopedic surgeon around this region. We are very grateful instead that this education have attracted um, many interests, all right, from many spine surgeons and orthopedic surgeons of this from this Asia Pacific regions. um from the past reports uh each webinar will have approximately 500 participants and not to mention uh, more than 1000 view after the webinar session so uh, i would like to take this opportunity to thank dr vishal the chairman of the online educational committee of asia pacific spine society and their team all right uh, for all the effort you know they have put up in the last uh, two years and this year as well to make this webinar series all right of educational great educational opportunity for all of us uh for today i'd like to thank our many speakers dr banu dr funao dr yamato from japan professor chris from malaysia professor grebio all right my good friend from singapore and not to mention dr sharif and dr shah who will be presenting the two interesting cases so with that I would like to thank you for your valuable valuable participation and I hope that you enjoy this session. Thank you very much. Thank you Professor Kwan. Uh so just for the sake of delegates I would like to mention that we have a series of lectures available and this is going to be an interactive session. All the delegates can actually put up their questions in the chat box of Ortho TV and those questions will be directed to our moderator Professor Ki Chi. who will be putting up these questions on behalf of delegates to the faculty members there are two interesting case discussions that are going to happen again the moderators will run the show but the questions from delegates are welcome at any point in time after the webinar is over this webinar recording is also going to be archived on the official website of asia pacific spine society available to delegates to come and see or review the the webinar again i welcome you all on behalf of asia pacific spine society to join this first webinar and also the many more that are in view in coming days uh, for the time table for which should be available also on behalf of the membership committee of asia pacific spine society i urge all the members and delegates who are viewing this webinar to join asia pacific spine society and join the mission of academic uh, inputs from the asia pacific spine society with this i hand over the proceedings to the moderators of the day dr kai sao from china and dr chikichu from malaysia to please on the academic program thank you uh, thank you vishal so um
without delay, I think we will move to the first uh, speaker of the day, uh, Dr. Tomohiro Banu, who will be presenting on thoracic pedicle screw fixation. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Tomohiro Banu from Hamamatsu. Uh, today, I will talk about the thoracic pedicle screw fixation. Please keep a recorded video. My name is Tomohiro Bano from Hamamatsu University School of Medicine. Uh, it's a great uh, honor to have the opportunity for presenting lecture in this IPSS we have simple gym. Today, I will talk about the freehand thoracic pedicle screw insertion technique. At first, I will explain how to insert thoracic pedicle screw by freehand. And after that, I will show the operative video for screw insertion. I have no COI to disclose. Accurate pedicle screw placement is very important to prevent interoperative complications. Like this picture, medial misplacement has risk of spinal cord injury. On the other hand, lateral, on the other hand, lateral misplacement has a potential risk of vessel and organ injury. In this case, the tip of pedicle screw injured esophagus. So in that case, revision is needed. For accurate pedicle screw in surgeon, wide surgical disclosure without bleeding is very important. Soft tissue must be removed meticulously and bone surface of laminar and transverse process should be exposed. At first, confirming lateral border of superior articular process. And after that, reach of transverse process and extended line of lateral border of superior articular process. Screw entry point is the intersection of the two lines. Such a direction should be perpendicular to the lamina. In our data, based on the technique, pedicle screw could be inserted accurately in 96.6% without fluoroscopy. Other literature reveals that no statistically significant difference was noted among freehand or arm navigation and robotic guidance. Right now, I will, I will show you the operative video in uh, inserting pedicle screw from uh, T12 to T10. The insertion point of T12 is the mid middle of the two hump. Remove the cortical uh, surface and the exposure can cancerous bone. The probe is inserted gradually to the length to the intended depth. Confirming trajectory using pedicle finder. Inner perforation towards the spinal canal and the outer penetration towards the anterior or lateral side should be confirmed. After tapping, screw inserted gently. Screw head should be placed deeply to prevent screw head prominence. This is T11. Remove the uh, cortical bone, confirm the lateral wall.
the central direction should be perpendicular to the lamina. <clears throat> this is T10. Confirming lateral border of superior article process. Screw entering point is the intersection of the two lines. Screw head uh, place deeply to prevent screw head prominence. And thank you for your kind attention. That's all. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing uh, your technique in uh, inserting thoracic radical screws. Um, we have, uh, let me check uh, the portal whether there's any question. So far, there's no question yet. So maybe I will start off with some questions. Um, is there any difference uh, of putting pedicle screw in the different uh, levels of thoracic, thoracic spine? Uh, for example, the proximal part compared to the uh, mid thoracic part and uh, the thoracolumbar, near, near the thoracolumbar junction part. Do ah, you yes. think there's any difference? Yeah. Uh, thank you. And in this video, I will show the lower level of thoracic. And C12 is uh, 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 unique. Uh, and uh, other part is the same. And uh, T12 or T10 is uh, almost same, but uh, Upper, uh, from middle level, uh, we need to put the screw from uh, a little bit uh, upper level. And uh, after that, the uh, upper thoracic level is uh, a little bit uh, lower in the uh, level. Um, what if uh, you uh, encounter, just say, for example, a lateral bridge uh, of the pedicle? Uh, what would you do uh, in that circumstances? Uh, I I it makes sense, but uh, uh, I feel the uh, pedicle use a use a pedicle finder uh, to confirm the lateral uh, uh, displacement, and uh, we confirm the intraoperative X-ray. Uh, we took the X-ray, and uh, uh, we need to uh, confirm the uh, penetration. Okay, uh, I'm interested to know, uh, uh, in the intraoperative x-rays, uh, do you use II or x-ray? X and uh, how, how do you uh, confirm whether this, uh, pad, uh, this, uh, traject uh, this pedicle uh, trajectory is uh, breached or is it uh, intact uh, on the x-rays? Mm -hmm. uh, we can confirm the uh, AP, AP view. Uh, from posterior to anterior view, uh, we can confirm the lateral or uh, medial penetration. We can predict, and uh, after that, uh, lateral view, we can all we also check the lateral view and the uh, upper level or lower level. We can uh, confirm direction of the sagittal direction. Yeah, all right. Um, there are so, some questions here. Okay, yeah. Sure, please. Anyone from the floor? Uh, uh, I, th I think uh, you should uh, study that uh, show the 
there's no significant difference between freehand technique and mm -hmm. uh, robot assistant uh, technique. So, uh, so what's your opinion about the uh, robot assistant technique in the uh, o o operation? Mm -hmm. I have no, uh, now I have no experience of robotic surgeon, so uh, uh, I cannot uh, understand. Uh, I cannot uh, respond to your question, but uh, uh, in my uh, feeling, uh, very difficult case. Uh, we cannot place a screw you know, using the robotic arm, even using the robotic arm. It is difficult, I think, in a narrow vehicle. Uh, and the further question is, uh, I, I want to know, just uh, want to know, uh, is, there, is there uh, some doctors in uh, Japan to use the ro robot assistant uh, technique? No. Uh, some doctors? Some doctors. In your in con yes. country, yeah. Yes, in yes, your country? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, um, Dr. Bano, uh, there are some questions from uh, the uh, faculty uh, uh, board. Uh, Dr. Ajoy and Dr. Vishal has the same question uh, or almost similar question. They want to know, in a rotated vertebra, do you have any special tips or tricks uh, to insert the thoracic uh, pedicle screw? And uh, especially uh, also for uh pedicles which is this plastic and small uh small small case uh in the small case we use uh on or navigation uh, uh, what i meant is uh in the in the vertebra which is very rotated and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and pedicle which is uh very small uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. what would you you recommend uh, uh, what's the recommendation tips and tricks very narrow case uh we uh we can put the screw from Lateral or uh, in out in uh, in out in technique. Okay, yeah. and you use the O arm to control. Your O arm or CT navigation. All right. Yeah. Uh, I think Doctor Srivasta asks, uh, "Do you co will you consider sagittal alignment uh, of the spine uh, from uh, cow caudal to cranial alignment?" or scoliosis and how will you determine whether your uh, yeah, yeah. trajectory is correct yeah, yeah. before operation we the, we always take our x-ray interoperative x-ray and uh uh we uh, can expect a direction such a direction uh using the x interoperative x-ray yeah okay uh, I think uh, Dr. Vishal also added one question. He asked whether uh, any salvage for burst pedicle or uh, medial wall bridge, uh, what would you do? Yeah. Uh, in uh, middle wall bridge, uh, at that time, uh, we can skip for uh, yeah. Very narrow cases, we cannot put that through. No. So you case. would abandon that pedicle and yes, skip? Yes. Yes. Um, I think maybe we will. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Banu. We will yes. move on to the next speaker. Thank you. Um, um, and I'll pass over to Dr. Kai Chow for introduction of the next uh, speaker. The, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Chris uh, from Malaysia. Now his uh, talk is uh, to it's uh, the uh, uh, extra pedicle. Uh, Soraska screw uh, fixation. Welcome. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kai Chow. Uh, allow me to share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, it's clear. Yeah, clear. Okay, I will share my slideshow now. Uh, thank you very much. So the topic is uh, extra pedicular thoracic screw fixation. After this lecture, I hope our audience would understand the indication, the anatomy of the pedicle rib unit, a little bit about the biomechanics of EP screws. The surgical technique will be demonstrated by a video and understand the pitfalls and the potential complications of uh, EP thoracic pedicle screws. 
So about the history. So Dr. Divarak is uh, mainly credited for introducing this trajectory of extra pedicular screw technique. And this was published in 1993, whereby he conducted a cadaveric study and the technique which he described utilizes the entry, which is at the cephalate one third of the tip of the transverse process and inserted perpendicular to the plane of the posterior elements along a 30 to 45 degree trajectory. And he reported very good and safe outcome. Why do we need EP thoracic screws? It's because we often encounter abnormal pedicles in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. In this study by Dr. Vishal Shawahi in 2014, more than 6,000 screws were uh, analyzed and he described type A as those with cancellous channel more than 4 mm, type B cancellous channel 2 to 4 mm, type C cortical channel more than 2 mm, type D cortical channel less than 2 mm, type B, C and D are considered abnormal pedicles and in this study, the incidence of abnormal pedicle is significant, significantly greater in the AIS group compared to a normal population. And there's a, correspond, there's a correlation at the upper thoracic spine compared to the rest of the spine at the concavity as well as with the cop angle. A similar study was published in 2010 by Dr. Watanabe. It is a prospective clinical series involving 53 scoliosis patients. Type A was described as when the pedicle probe can be inserted smoothly and is a large cancellous channel. Type B is when it's inserted snugly, small cancellous channel. Type C is when you need to tap it in with a mallet. This is considered a cortical channel. Type D is when there is no channel and you require a juxta pedicular technique. In his study, type C, there's the highest occurrence over the main thoracic concavity. And as compared to type D, the highest occurrence is over the proximal thoracic concavity. And there's again a correlation with cop angle. Let's understand a bit about the anatomy of the pedicle rib unit. In this study, which was car carried out by Hasted in 2004, this is a computer tomography study involving 98 patients. They found that the pedicle rib unit is significant, significantly larger in width compared to the thoracic pedicle at every level of the thoracic pedicle. Similarly, in this study, which was published uh, in the Korean population in 2009, this is a cadaveric study, and they found that their results was comparable to Hasted data in the sense that the average pedicle rib unit width is between 14 to 19 millimeters with a cord length of 45 to 65 millimeters. A bit about the biomechanics. Uh, this study, which was mentioned earlier, uh, showed that the extra pedicular technique actually has a higher pullout strength compared to the conventional technique. However, in this paper by Yuxel, published in the Spine Journal 2007, this is a cadaveric study, which shows that uh, extra pedicular screws has 80% of the pullout strength of intra pedicular screws, but if it is used as a salvage for burst intra pedicular screws, the pullout strength is approximately 65%. And in this meta analysis comparing intra and extra pedicular screws, there was only one study which shows that extra pedicular screw is stronger. The rest of the study shows that uh, extra pedicular screws are actually weaker than trans pedicular screws but in the forest plot, there is no significant difference. Now for the surgical video demonstration. In our surgical technique, which we're gonna describe, the ones which is used in our institution compared to the traditional trajectory, we have a more medial EP entry, which is inserted along the pedicle axis. Therefore, there's a less convergent trajectory and leading to a shorter cord length, but it allows an easier path for insertion, especially in the scoliotic spine. And in our, in our unit, we routinely use a cannulated screw system because from our study, which was published in 2017, it is a computed tomography study of 1,524 pedicle screws, whereby 302 was inserted in dysplastic pedicles. There were two groups, group one cannulated system, group two conventional technique. When we compare this group, the overall, overall perforation rate was 4.5% in group one, 15.6% in group two. For the anterior perforation rate, it was 1.9% in the cannulated system group compared to 8.8% in the conventional technique group. And the overall critical perforation was also lower, 
2.6% in group 1 and 6.8% in group 2. So the case which we're going to show is a 25-year-old lady, adult idiopathic scoliosis with the following curve. We're going to demonstrate the surgical demonstration over the right T3 type C pedicle. And this is the uh, computed tomography of this patient at T3 level. This is the anticipated trajectory. So the entry point is over the conventional entry point for thoracic pedicle screw as described by Dr. Bano. So the entry point is rounded. Subsequently, we advance it medially. We enlarge the entry point medially and cephalate using a carison ronger as shown here. And the reason we advance it immediately is so that we can palpate the medial wall easier. So in this video, the pedicle probe, a curve probe is directed laterally. And what we are palpating is the medial wall of the pedicle until we reach the closed isthmus, as you can see in this video. Subsequently, we are going to tap we're going to tap the pedicle probe laterally until it's about 10 to 15 millimeters. And you can see that then I will rotate the probe 180 degrees and tap it medially until it is engaged at 15 to 20 millimeters at the yellow point. You can hear the probe is actually engaged over the bone. Next, we check the probe position and we rotate the II gantry 5 to 10 degree less than the trajectory of the pedicle probe to get this view. And in this next video, the pedicle probe is tapped into the vertebral body until it goes to 25 to 30 millimeters. We palpate the track to appreciate the transition from the costal vertebral joint to the vertebral body as shown here. Next, we insert the cannulated wire. We check and confirm the wire position using image intensifier and the RI position is rotated along the trajectory of the wire. And this is what the RI shows. Then we insert the pedicle screw. And in this case, the CD scan shows this is the placement of the cannulated pedicle screw system in the dysplastic pedicle. A bit of pitfalls. Pitfall number one is surgeons tend to aim too inferior and aiming harder is because of the perception of kyphosis. Second, because the inferior part of the pedicle is unprotected by the rib and therefore this tends to be a misplaced pedicle screw. So the solution is to carry sense superiorly to aim the pedicle probe towards the contralateral screw entry point and to confirm the placement with the II. Before number two is when the screws are too long and not medial enough. So the structure at risk is at the uh, proximally th proximal thoracic is over the trachea and esophagus. So if on the lateral view, we can see that the screw is beyond the anterior border of the vertebra, there's very high chance that the screw is impinging on the vital structures. And in this CD scan, you can see that this is how it appears. And that is the trachea. At the apical main thoracic, the aorta is on the left side and is at risk in the screw which is too long or not medial enough. So the solution is to use a 25 to 30 millimeter screws using the medial referencing technique. Over the main thoracic spine is 30 to 35 millimeter. Always confirm with II and to use cannulated screws. Pitfall three is to recognize non-favorable pedicle rib unit. The yellow part shows there's a nice step to engage the probe, whereas the red line show that there is no step to engage the probe. Secondly, the shape of the vertebral body is very important. Yellow shape is favorable, whereas the red triangular shape is not favorable. The solution is to use a preoperative CT scan to study the anatomy, use cannulated screws, and to use the shorter screws. Conclusion. Mastery of EP thoracic pedicle screws is important in scoliosis because of high prevalence of dysplastic pedicle. The pedicle rib unit is favorable to accommodate pedicle screws up to even 6.5 millimeters. Biomechanical studies show that there's comparable strength. Medial referencing technique allows the easier entry of the screw, but limited by the shorter cord length. The pitfalls must be understood, and the use of the cannulated system and familiarity using II can avoid these pitfalls. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat>
I think uh, there's uh, some questions. And, uh, do you, do you, uh, there's a question from the, I think it's from uh, audience and uh, he, his question is, uh, do you apply a particle screw and the extra particle screw at the same time because the rod placement seems to be difficult uh, harmoniously? Uh, thank you very much for the question from uh, Dr. Funao. Uh, that, that is one of the reasons why we do not use the conventional pathway. So we use the medial entry, which is inserted along the pedicle trajectory. Uh, therefore, we can uh, achieve a harmonious placement with the, aligning the head together. If you use a very lateral pathway, then you might have problem as described by uh, Dr. Funao, whereby the screw head uh, mount aligned. Yeah, so maybe I have a question for Prof. Chris. Yeah, how do you decide uh, which screw to use uh, extra particular and which screw you can still try for uh, particular screw insertion? Um, because you need to plan for which uh, technique to use. Yeah, that's a very good question, uh, Prof. Chu. Uh, thank you very much. If we have a pre-operative CD scan, that would be very useful because we can see whether there's a cantilus channel or there's no cantilus channel. However, in type C pedicle, then it is a bit tricky because um, if the bones are soft and particularly in the pediatric population, uh, we can sometimes dilate the very thin cancellous channel with a probe. But in the case which are shown, it is an adult case whereby the uh, cancellous channel is closed, then we need to apply the extra pedicular screws. So, um, and the second way is that we can determine which type to use is intraoperatively is to see whether we can engage the cancellous channel. If intraoperatively we are not able to find the cancellous channel, then it is probably safer to actually uh, knock the probe laterally and apply an extra pedicular trajectory. Yeah, yeah there is a question from Dr. Srivasta. She he asks, uh, what is the incidence of vascular complication in extra pedicular screw? Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, studies or any anecdotal case reports of uh, uh, describing vascular injury using extra pedicular screws technique, but, but definitely uh, the risk is there, particularly if you're inserting extra pedicular screws from the left side. Uh, so it is good to actually study the vascular anatomy preoperatively using a uh, computer tomography. And um, one must be aware of the length as well as the trajectory of the screw uh, because if we are not able to uh, engage a very medial trajectory and we use a very long screws, for example, a 40 millimeter screw or 45 millimeter screws, then I'm quite certain that the vascular structure is at risk. Uh, just like the case example which I showed, uh, the aorta was actually really abutting to the vertebral body. And normally we see this in a less, uh, in a scoliosis with a lower cop angle. The bigger the cop angle normally is safer because the uh, vascular structures are further away. But in a case whereby the cop angle is, is very small, for example, a 50 degree curve, normally the aorta is closer to the vertebral body. That, that's our experience, but, to, but I'm not aware of any uh, literature which uh, describe the incidence of vascular complications. Thank you. Um, I think uh, maybe we, yeah, we, we need to move to the next speaker. All right, thank you very much, Prof. Chris. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Kai Chow. So we will move on to the next speaker, who, uh, uh, next talk, which will be presented by Dr. Haruki Funao on adult spinal deformity surgery, reducing blood loss and complication. Hey, thank you very much for everyone uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I have a pre-recorded uh, pre presentation, so could you start my uh, presentation? Thank you for giving me this opportunity. I'm Haruki Funao from International University of Health and Welfare. Today, I'm going to talk about adult spinal deformity surgery, focusing on reduction of blood loss and complications. I have nothing to disclose. Adult spinal deformity surgery is one of the challenging spine surgeries. Surgery can achieve good global alignment and clinical outcome. However, as you know, complication rate is very high. 
Most of the studies reported mean blood loss was around 2 liters. Look at Cho reported overall complication rate was 68%, and they found that excessive blood loss more than 2 liters was the most significant risk factor for perioperative complications. Another study also showed that blood loss was significantly greater in the patient with delayed infections. Thus, we're going to have to reduce blood loss during other spinal deformity surgery to minimize surgical site infection and complications. Implant associated complications should also be avoided. Misplacement may lead to neural, vessel, or organ injuries. Advanced image guidance would be helpful for accuracy and safety, especially in spinal deformity surgery. So how can we reduce complications in other spinal deformity surgery? My opinion is that reducing blood loss and prevention of implant-associated complications are two important factors. Minimally invasive procedure can be combined with conventional techniques, and the noble image guidance such as CT navigation can be useful. The combination of MIS lateral number interval diffusion with posterior spinal fusion may have several advantages. Bilateral annual release leads to a good correction both of coronal and sagittal deformity, and a large footprint interval cage can be a good anterior support holding the cortex bone of vertebra from end to end. Less bleeding is ex expected because there is no need to treat epidural bleeding, and we can also preserve posterior bone elements, and in revision surgery, Neurological complications can be minimized because scar tissues don't have to be resected. Recent studies have reported that posterior spinal fusion combined with lateral approach demonstrated lower blood loss compared to posterior spinal fusion with three column osteotomies. This is a patient with lumbar kyphosis. The patient had a history of Parkinson's disease and she underwent 3 L3 and L4 laminectomy at the previous hospital. After the surgery, she developed osteoporotic vertebral fractures from L1 to L4. There were fractures from L1 to L4, and all fractures seem to be no union. Although anterior coram reconstruction is required, it might be difficult to obtain good anterior support by posterior spinal surgery, and there was a risk of neurological injuries to perform PD or three-column osteotomies through the scar tissue. In such a case, lateral interbody fusion with a large interbody cage is a good option for osteoporotic spine, and the neurological complications are also minimized because scar tissues don't have to be dissected. Long spinal fusion up to the upper thoracic spine was needed because she had a history of Parkinson's disease. She tolerated these procedures without major complications, and she is doing well even after three years, and the good bone union was achieved without any implant failures. This is a patient with lumbosacral kyphosis. She had a history of posterior lateral fusion from L4 to the sacrum. Although surgical balance was not so bad, but her pelvis was retrobodied, and she needed much effort to stand up straight, as we can see here. Because L4 to the sacrum was already fused, she underwent anterior coram realignment by cutting LLL at the L3-4 by intervertebral level with a small amount of blood loss. Core navigation technology was introduced in 1980s and it is very common nowadays. If you were driving on an unfamiliar road, you will be unconfident and anxious. But if you use a car navigation system, you will become more confident and can be relaxed. CT navigation is particularly useful in spinal deformity surgery. Deviation rate of thoracic pedicle screws by freehand is reported up to 15% in AIS surgery. In contrast, accuracy rate is almost 99% in using CT navigation. Navigation is also useful in lateral interval diffusion. In the case of a big osteophyte or rotatory deformity, it is likely to slip when insert instrument bends and this may lead to major vessel or organ injury. This patient had big osteophyte and narrow disc space, but I could identify the intervertebral space and the direction. 
We assess deviation rate of pedicle screw insertion and the intraoperative blood loss in 42 patients with adult spinal deformity surgery. Surgery was performed combined with lateral access surgery using intraoperative CT navigation. Deviation rate of pedicle screws and the navigation was 5.84%. It was significantly lower compared with that of 15.6% in the freehand group. Actually, most of pedicle screws that breached lateral row were placed in out in into narrow pedicles. So the rate of problematic screws was only 0.7% in the navigation. It was significantly lower than that of 3.8% in the freehand group. Mean blood loss was 77 gram in lateral access surgery and 840 gram in posterior spinal fusion. I think lateral access surgery was effective to reduce blood loss and the CT navigation enabled us to insert pedicle screws more confident and accurate without the need of replacement of the screws. Nowadays, fractionous pedicle screws PPS are widely used in various spinal surgeries. Recently, PPS are beginning to be used in spinal deformity surgery as well. Lateral interbody infusion and PPS are good combination for correcting lumbar scoliosis and kyphosis. However, this technique is still under development, thus it is limited in mild spinal deformity at our facilities. International Spine Study Group compared three groups, MIS, hybrid, and open surgeries. Mean PINL change was smaller for the MIS and SPA correction was greater for the open groups. However, MIS group had much lower blood loss and transfusion rates compared with other groups, and major complication rates were significantly higher in the open groups. So surgeons should choose the surgical approach considering the required correction as well as the risk of complications. Reducing blood loss is desirable to minimize complications in ASD surgery. Modification of operative techniques such as lateral access surgery may reduce blood loss. CT-based navigation is useful as a reference. However, meticulous planning and hand sensations are always important. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Kunal, for the lecture. Um, let me see, is there any questions? Uh, there's no question yet. Maybe I'll start with the first question. Um, I think broadly you dis divide the adult deformity to three groups, the MIS, full MIS group, the hybrid group, and uh, the open group. So uh, number question number one, how do you decide uh, which uh, approach you can use for uh, certain patients? Is there any specific uh, guidance on who will be very suitable for, for MIS and who will not be suitable? And, will need open or hybrid. Uh, question number two is, uh, what is hybrid actually? Uh, is it a spectrum of uh, MIS and open com uh, technique or is, is it a specific uh, technique that is uh, quite standard? Yeah. So, oh, thank you for the question. So, I, if I uh, choose the uh, operative uh, approach, so, First of all, uh, if the, the patient need a L5S1 uh, fusion, if the, the patient doesn't need a L5S1, uh, that kind of patient uh, can have the uh, MIS and PPS as strategies. And uh, if the patient uh, needs to be have uh, the L5S1 uh, fusion, so I, I have to choose. Uh, I, I will uh, choose the operative technique based on the uh, fulcrum bending film. Uh, the PI and uh, mismatch. Uh, if the, the more than uh, 30 degrees, I have to do the open surgery, uh, definitely. Sometimes uh, that kind of patient needs uh, three color moisture tonics. And uh, another reason is that if the patient uh, totally tolerates the, the procedure, the, the patient, if the patient uh, is very elderly the patient, uh, that kind of patient doesn't need a uh, very, uh, not, uh, adequate PILL uh, uh, mismatch. Uh, it's uh, already published in the, uh, maybe uh, from the International Spine Study Group. Uh, that if the elderly patient uh, uh, have the other spine and deformed surgery, uh, they will have the uh, less, less, uh, yeah, uh, less 
<laughs> ideal correction is not uh, always needed. Yeah, we do not need to achieve the full correction, right? Yeah. 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 Full correction, yes. yeah. How, how about the second question? Uh, what do you uh, mean by hybrid? Uh, is it uh, depend on different surgeons that have different uh, approach or is it a standard uh, um, nowadays, uh, approach? Yeah, and nowadays uh, the, the hybrid approach is a little bit beginning to be uh, standard for some uh, spine surgeons. But uh, for uh, most of the surgeons, the open technique is uh, very uh, common uh, now. But uh, for the MIS guys, MIS spine surgeons, uh, they likely to do the, the uh, hybrid or minimally invasive way uh, to reduce the blood flows and the complications. I think uh, anyway, we need to reduce the blood flows because it's very related to uh, the postoperative complications. So we need to reduce the blood flows anyway and uh, any uh, implant associated complications. That's why I, I use the uh, CAT scan navigation and uh, uh, minimally invasive uh, lateral interbody fusion if I uh, apply the, uh, this, these techniques. Am I? <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, let me see whether there is any other question. Um, I think, um, yeah, okay. Uh, Dr. Yu Yamato uh, asks, what age do you think is the appropriate age for corrective surgery considering the complication? Uh, thank you very much for the very good question. So I think the up to 80s, <laughs> I do not do a surgery for uh, 90s, <laughs> but it depends on the, completely depends on the patient's condition. Uh, if the, the patient have uh, no uh, comorbidities, I, I would apply maybe uh, early 80s, but uh, I'm not sure <laughs> if the patient have uh, several comorbidities, I would apply uh, maybe in my way, but uh, if the patient needs a major surgery, uh, I, I will discuss with the uh, patient and the family. <laughs> All right. Um, Dr. Srivasta asks, do you have some specific preparation in your pre-op checklist to reduce bleeding? Is there any tips? Uh, tips, uh, yeah. So if the, the nutrition, I will check the nutrition and uh, also uh, APTT or PT, uh, normal uh, breathing, breathing uh, evaluation. Uh, but I'm not sure. Uh, or uh, if uh, the patient has a liver dysfunction or something, mm, it uh, depends on the, uh, the blood test and nutrition condition and the uh, uh, past medical histories. Okay. Uh, Dr. Jonayet asks, uh, what is your routine practice for maintaining BP to reduce blood loss? Uh, I think maybe uh, intraoperatively. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So I would uh, ask the uh, anesthesiologist to re uh, uh, reduce the blood loss, but sometimes it's uh, cause uh, the eye problem. So we need to check the uh, condition of the eye. Uh, uh, because the, if the patient has a glaucoma, it's going to be difficult to reduce the blood loss and there also uh, some cardiovascular problem. So it depends on the patient's condition, but uh, I will ask the anesthesiologist uh, as much as possible to reduce the uh, blood, blood pressure. And after the surgery, uh, also I will apply the, uh, uh, low, the medication uh, to reduce the blood loss after the surgery also. So uh, intraoperatively, uh, just for uh, to add on to the question, intraoperatively, what is your target BP or mean arterial pressure that you would prefer? Uh, yeah, so 80 or, yeah, maybe 80. But uh, it's, uh, it depends on the anesthesiologist's answer. <laughs> mm. uh, one, maybe one more question uh, from Dr. Uh, Chun Man Ma. Ma, Man Ma. May I know how do we assess the risk and pre prevent cage subsidence 
in only for the first case. Okay. Um, maybe he is referring to the patient with osteoporosis. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. So, and uh, it, I will check the uh, the X-ray first to check the the approach is uh, very easy or difficult. If the pelvis is very high, uh, that kind of case uh, it's going to be difficult to uh, perform only if uh, at L four five. Sometimes the, the direction goes to the inferior inferior. Uh, and that's going to be uh, injuring the uh, superior uh, end plate of the L5. Mm. And then also, All right. yes. Yeah, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, please continue. Yeah, what do you want to comment? Anything? Uh, no, 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 it's okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Funao. So uh, we'll move on to the next speaker. Next speaker, it's uh, Dr. Yu. He talked about the bait, uh, the, the, the edax screw fixation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kai Chao. Hello, everyone. Uh, today, my topic is uh, edax screw fixation. Please start my video. Today, I'll talk about iliac screw fixation in adult spinal deformity surgery. Why do we need iliac screws? In this case, we performed corrective fusion from T10 to S1. But only two months later, the S1 screw loosening happened and distal junctional kyphosis occurred. Adult spinal deformity require a strong pelvic anchors to correct the spinal pelvic alignment and maintain it. Historically, the Galveston method, the L-shaped rod used for iliac anchors, this was reported in 1983. This method is a strong anchor, but technically very difficult. It's not a common method. The iliac screw is also known as a screw galveston. This is a very powerful pelvic anchor and is useful for correcting and maintaining spinal pelvic alignment in adult spinal deformity surgery. The advantage of iliac screw, a strong anchor to pelvis, no penetration to sacroiliac joint, and no radiation exposure in estrogen. Now we can put dual iliac screw. And it's difficult to break and easy to remove screws. But the iliac screw has disadvantages. Screws do not line up on the spinal screws. And then we must use connectors and requires extensive surgical field development. And sometimes the prominence of the screw head is a problem. This section describes how to insert the iliac screw. The insertion point is posterior superior iliac spine. A slightly proximal position is also acceptable. The insertion direction of pedicle probe is very important. The medial and lateral direction should be parallel to external iliac plate. The cephalocaudal direction is perpendicular to the sacrum surface. It is also recommended that the insertion be directed to AIIS or a greater trochanter. After probing, make sure there is no perforation 
with uh, using a feeder. Then insert the screw. Tapping is not necessary. Usually we use the diameter, screw diameter 7.5 to 9.5 millimeters. And the screw length minimum 70 millimeters. Our trajectory. The trajectory B is considered to be the best, but A is also sufficient. I will show you how to insert the European screen in video. Expose PSIS primary and reject bone of insertion point. And uh, check the direction of external plate of the crest. And also check the position of greater trochanter and insert the probe perpendicular to the sacrum and parallel to the external wall of iliac crest. We confirm no perforation with feeler. And insert the screw as deeply as possible so that the screw head does not protrude beyond the surrounding bone. We must check the screw height. And our lateral X-ray image confirms the screw is perpendicular to the sacrum. The tips of insertion iliac screw the reject the bone at the insertion site sufficiently. Insert the screw head deeper than the surrounding bone. Determine the insertion site considering the position of S1 screw and connectors. Insert parallel to external iliac plate. The direction is difficult to determine. Uh, iliac screw is a strong pelvic anchor. We can correct the pelvis to antiversion using the cantilever technique. This is a L4 PSO case. Uh, we can see the pelvis largely antiverted. Uh, malposition of iliac screw can sometimes lead to serious complications. In this case, medial and lateral perforation occurred. In this case, the left iliac screw protruded anteriorly from the sacroiliac joint. This is very dangerous because it is very close to the internal iliac artery and the vein. This, this case shows a uh, screw head protruded from the iliac crest. This may cause a decubitus after surgery. Take home message. Iliac screw is a strong pelvic anchor and useful in adult spinal deformity surgery. The advantage is X-ray free, no damage to sacral iliac joint. The deep implantation and the direction of screwing are important for safety. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Yu. And uh, is there any questions from the panel or the audience? Uh, I want to start the questions. Uh, do you uh, have met, do you met some uh, complications uh, related to the area school uh, during your uh, experience? 
thank you. Uh, uh, we we have the many complications. The first is uh, the the excluded protein the inter purpose. So the touch uh, uh, common uh, inter iliac uh, vessel. So but uh, I want we want to try to pull pull out after surgery. But the uh, vascular surgeon denied it's a very dangerous. So only we, uh, we can observe it. Uh, now the, after five years, uh, it's no problem, but uh, I wonder <laughs> it's okay or not. And the next is, uh, yeah. uh, you, you mean the complications? Yes? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh... How uh, what what kind of a complication do you met? Uh, did you met uh, uh, in your the clinical experience when you yes, insert uh, the iliac screw? Yeah. Yes. Uh, next compression is the proteinogen. So sometimes uh, uh, the we cannot put the screw the. Not not so deep. So after that, uh, the screw head protruded to the iliac crest. So patients uh, had pain at the iliac uh, screw head, and some maybe the two or three cases uh, have decubitus on the screw head. So we must remove the iliac screw. Yeah, yeah. I I, I mean I, I see, and it's related with the prominent of the screw. And uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Shar, uh, Jonathan uh, have a question. Do you use uh, routinely iliac screw rather than S2 AI screw? Thank you. Thank you for the question. The, that's a, the answer is a yes. Uh, we use only iliac screw, not S2 AI screw. Because uh, the reason is that uh, 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 we 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 did the uh, I want to the not the violation of the sacroiliac joint. Uh, I want to avoid it because uh, and the next is a uh, no radiation exposure. Uh, usually we can we did not use navigation or. Uh, the imaging test fire, so iliac screw, the we can put it, so no, no additional image. So that that's the reason uh, we use iliac screw. Yeah, may, may I continue to ask uh, based on this question? Why? What is the reason you are not keen to cross the SI joint? Uh, is there any particular reason? Uh, uh okay. The SR joint is a movable, as you know. Yeah. The, sometimes the SI, SI, SI AI screw the loosening and uh, broken. So after broken, the, we cannot uh, remove the screw. So the, it's very difficult to uh, revision, make revision. So uh, I want to avoid uh, the vibration by uh, joint. Okay, thank you. Maybe uh, after that, the next lecture, next faculty member uh, lecturer yeah. will answer Professor this question. Gabriel, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Gabriel, yes. Okay. Uh, I think Dr. Haruki uh, is, uh, asked a question. He asked uh, what size is most common and do you recommend uh, uh, and do you recommend, or what size is most common to recommend for good distal foundation? Thank you for your question. So we commonly use a 7.5 diameter screw and the length is over 70. But it's enough. Uh, not so, well, it is not necessary to put a more big screw. Thank you. Okay. 
thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yu Yamato. Uh, maybe we move on to the next lecture. So uh, the next presenter will be Professor Gabriel Rilu, who will be presenting on S2 ALA iliac screw fixation. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And then uh, before I start, I want to thank ABSS for the uh, kind invitations and particularly um, uh, Professor Chu, Professor Kai Chou for the um, invite. I must confess, I'm not really an s 2 la ILEX screw person, but uh, I'm more like a, a Professor Yamato, the uh, ILEX screw person, but we will talk about a mixture of both. And I would like to also recommend uh, to, to propose uh, alternative of lumbosacral fixation using our subcrestal ILEX screw techniques. I have no, nothing to disclose. As Professor Yamato was talking about that most of us nowadays to do deformity, we have to fix to the ileum. And most commonly, the fixation sewn in the ileum is really sewn one, which is basically S1, sewn two, which is ALA and S3. But the best fixation is really in the ileum situation. In the ileum, the traditional ileum screw, which uh, uh, Professor Yamato have already talked about, and of course, there is also the S2 ALA ileum screw. When do we use watch? Well, first of all, um, in the traditional ILEX screw, as, as previously spoken to, the entry point is really about two centimeter from the posterior inferior ILEX spine, aiming towards about 45 degree down towards the greater trochanter area and 45 degree tilted towards the, the distal end. That is usually your entry point. And previously point out, if it is, that is important to cite the screw just above the exitablum where the bone is the strongest in that particular aspect. But a mechanical study already demonstrated the ILEX screw with the S1 screw, as, as uh, Dr. Yamato talked about, is Gardenson screw, which is a particularly strong technique. Long term result putting in the ILEX screw and then or fixing to the uh, ileum reduces to the arthrosis for L5S1 from about 50% all the way down to about 10% plus or minus. And also, this will reduce the potential sacral fracture as well in the long term follow up for the adult deformity uh, fixation. The problem with this screw is really is, is the prominence. Even though we cited the screw at the ILEC crest, and then you, is this going to be difficult for you to, to, to connect because the distal end of the screw is still import, uh, sticking out of the, of the rod. In addition to this, you often have to use a connector in order to connect the screw together because they are of different plane. And as you know, one connector can easily cost up to 1,500 USD dollars. And then you have two, then you will add to the significant cost of your surgery. And this often leading to the removal of the, of the island screw in about 30% of the population. The other problem with the traditional ILEX screw, particularly in children, is that the ileum is not well formed in children. Most of them are cartilage and as a result, therefore, the traditional ILEX screw may not be possible. This leading to the development of the S2 ALA ILEX screw by Poncella from John Hopkins. And uh, uh, this is particularly developed into the children. And as, as he continues to develop, his, his colleagues from John Hopkins do adult deformity. Carl Kipash had used the same screw applied to the, um, to the, to the adult deformity. And uh, so first of all, what, what we do is that in the entry point of the S2 ALA ILEX screw, basically you, you go between the entry point between the S1 foramen and S2 foramen. And through the S, between the S1-2 foramen, you aim towards the anterior inferior ILEX spine, the screw, and then from then crosses this SI joint into the ileum, into the, into the situation. In this particular situation, then it will allow you to use a longer screw uh, for that aspect. So what's the difference between an S2 ALA ILEX screw and the traditional ILEX screw? Well, first of all, you'd see appears to be a longer screw because there's a 30, 30, 40 cent millimeter of the screw is actually in the sacrum. And in addition to this, it is in line with the construct, therefore making the connection quite easy and without the need of using the, um, the side connector. And also because it is in line, therefore you do not need to use a connector, which reduce the cost of your surgery as well. In addition to this, because it's less direction, it is just about the sacrum and therefore it is not prominent. And as a result, it will allow you to have less prominent complication related to the S2A ILEX screw compared to the traditional. 
But the disadvantage, as Dr. Yamato was, was talking about, is that, well, some most of us uh, will probably require some form of eye-eye or, or fluoroscope or, or navigation in order to put this screw comfortably into the joint because we have to go through the, S, um, the Seiko eyelet joint. Uh, that is going to be one of the things. And whereas the traditional eyelet screw, you can actually just apply freehand and it's quite actually quite fast and it's quite cheap in order to do so as well. We compare the two screw in the literature and then, uh, and of course it has demonstrated that S2 ALA eyelet screw have complication rate higher in terms of removal, in terms of prominence and potential loosening. But to be fair to the, to the traditional ILAC screw, most of this comparison is, is, is related to the early study in the traditional ILAC screw. Now that we know what we know, and then the complication of the rate of the traditional ILAC screw, I would imagine would be much lesser. In the, but the S2 ALA ILAC screw is not without problem. In the early design of the techniques and then screw breaks from the screw head has been described. And in addition to this, particularly from the um, from European spine, from spine, I mean from France, they talk about if you use the S2 ALA ILAC screw, particularly in severe osteoporotic patient, because the distal end uh, with the sacrum is osteoporotic, this about one third of this type of screw may become loosened compared to the traditional ILAC screw because most of the distal end of the sacrum is hollow and as a result leading to a difficult fixation uh, point in this aspect. Finally, as, as, as previously mentioned, that in, in, in the S2 ALA ILAC screw, it has to go through the SI joint. And because it goes through the SI joint, there was this, always this unknown effect of whether you develop into the uh, sacral, um, sacral joint, um, SI joint arthritis, leading to long-term chronic uh, spine pain. While having said that, the SI joint movement is only about a few degrees, but long-term irritation is difficult to determine, and, um, and, and this is one of the potential concerns. So in about 2017, we reported the use of the subcrestal ILAC screw, which is a modified technique of the ILAC screw. And the entry point is really at the, at the level of S1 foramen, or just below the S1 foramen, just above the SI joint and below the ILAC crest. And so what it does is that you can see that, that the techniques is started off, off with the, just about the, the distal end of the ILAC screw. And then you can see that, that it, you don't need to do a, as much dissection as the traditional ILAC screw. And then all you need to do is just above the SI joint at, as the S1 foramen or just below it and put a thumb uh, just underneath the ILAC crest and then that burr a hole in that to make a pilot hole. And by doing that, you ensure the screws will be low profile as well as it is quite um, uh, uh, buried by the, by the eyelet crest. And you can see that you can actually use a straight awl to create an entry point and then use a filler to find your way aiming towards the greater chokander. And around 5 cm area, what we often find is quite tough, the bone. You have to hammer it through because that is the dense bone. So that is the, the, one of the, tri uh, the tricks that uh, we, we discover. After that, it's just a big pedicle, and then you can just measure as per normal pedicle uh, 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 screw uh, in insertion. And uh, one of the other things that about the tapping of the ILAC screw or the subcrestal ILAC screw is the fact that, that uh, if these elderly patients, then tapping is not usually not a problem. You can just continue to go through by zero dilatation. But if it's a strong heart bone, you really need to have, uh, uh, don't stop turning your, 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 your tapping because the minute you stop, you may get stuck inside. And therefore, remember to always clean the tap. And also the other thing that we, we identified is that uh, we tend to flush away the, uh, the bone marrow from the, uh, from the hole because we actually have fat emboli before from insertion of this screw. It's like a long bone femur fixation fracture and as a result causing problem. To connect the screw there, what we did was that we used a, a MIS sleeve uh, using as a reduction device in order for you to do so. And by doing that, you don't really need to have uh, add onto a side connector and you can actually do the screw and relatively save the cost uh, involved in here. And you can see the screw is not through the SI joint. And we can apply this technique in, in MIS technique as well. And then the way to do this is similar to what we talk about. Again, it's a crestal screw. We make a screw um, at the S1 foramen or S2, S1, S2 foramen area. 
we put a cut about a one and a half cm away from the uh, eyelash crest and then just put put um, the finger dissection into the sacrum and walk towards the SI joint and puncture the medial wall uh, in order to uh, for the for the Jamshidi needle and then of course you have to be able to use the um, teardrop view in order to find out what happened by rotating your CM 45 degree and tilt your CM 45 degree you will be able to get the teardrop view which is particularly important to check all the ilium fixation after that again it's like any other MIS techniques and then you basically insert the screw and after the screw you connect the rod towards the patient as the techniques, as recently we start to use navigation system, and then basically one, one of the things that I find is useful is particularly selecting the AP synthetic view. Um, instead of using a 2D axial view, I selected one of the AP synthetic view using it to create a teardrop. In addition to this, I find this view, the 2D ILM view is particularly uh, 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 easy for us to use. And you can just, just put in the screw into the, into the system uh, quite easily. Maybe the s 2 a ILEX screw or the traditional ILEX screw. And the other thing that is particularly good is the fact that, that the sequence that I insert the screw is always the L5 first and follow the uh, subcrestal screw. And then last, I will insert the S1 screw. And this is by doing so, you can then triangulate the position of the S1 screw to allow easy connection between the L5 and the, um, and the ILEX screw. And because S1 screw pedicle is very big, they give you room for error to do so. This is some of the early example that we did the techniques and developing the techniques and then with some metastatic spine. This is basically just instrumentation and then fix the screw and then the patient can mobilize early, have early radiotherapy, chemotherapy around two weeks after the surgery as compared to the traditional situation, the wound healing is much less. As the techniques become more mature, of course, uh, we can put in double, double screws and also four rods techniques. And we developed this as a four, four, four quadrant teardrop concept. We put the, the short screw on the upper outer uh, teardrop and then connect that to L5, which allows the screw to be more obliquely inserted. And this is your outer rod. And then your main rod inside, and then it's the inner quadrant, which allows you for you to easily uh, apply the two screws. And finally, this is uh, applied to the de degenerative cases. This is a um, 78 years old, um, and, sorry, 70 years old uh, lady who have a T score of negative 2.4 with a sagittal and coronal malalignment and L5, uh, S L5 S1 pain. And this is basically what happened we do nowadays for our adult deformity correction. And this is what happened. And you can see pre-op and post-op using the subcrestal ILEX screw allows you to have a, a powerful correct anchor at the base as well as a corrective power for you to do so. So in summary, um, both uh, traditional ILEX screw and s 2 a ILEX screw is good and that the s 2 a ILEX screw tends to have less lesser complication compared to the uh, traditional ILEX screw in the early literature and we propose a new uh, modification of the ILEX screw which is a suppressor ILEX screw. They have the advantage of the s 2 a ILEX screw in terms of low profile and less complication and also the advantage of the ILEX screw which is freehand. And thank you very much for your for for considering me this technique, and uh, and just finally, and then uh, we, again we we just want to to let you know that uh, I'm come from Singapore, and then we're looking forward to to you to join us any any via any of these fellowships that you can apply to us, and also looking forward for you to join our Singapore Spine Society annual meeting in the 17 and 18 March, uh, in 2023 or maybe in 21-24 March in 2024. Looking forward to see you all. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Gabriel. Yeah, very, very uh, uh, interesting uh, lecture. So, um, see, there's uh, no question yet. Maybe I will start uh, with, uh, okay, uh, Dr. Bano asks, how about the accuracy of a uh, subcrestal screw? Um, in terms of the accuracy, if you talk about the EC for insertion, I mean, it's really just a big pedicle. And then uh, once you get inside the inner table of the ilium, uh, you can just shove the screw inside and between the tactile field, between the outer inner table, and then you can actually feel and guide the screw to go in. And just at five centimeter, that part, we're just above the exit tablet. It's a bit tough. 
that is the part that you worried about whether it goes out of the uh, uh, outer table or not. So that is the part that, that usually I just gently tap and then or maybe use the feeler to get inside. And then if I get the feeler uh, all the way to about 60, 70 centimeter, then I check a teardrop view. If the trajectory lo looks okay, then do the usual um, insertion of a pedicle screw techniques. And, and, and the margin of, of, of error is quite large. I mean, um, there's a, it's a big place for you to put in the screw. Yes. Yeah, is there any situation you need to cut a uh, part of the helium to put this screw? Or uh, you can consistently just uh, find the entry and put it without cutting the bone? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, as I mean, uh, this I mean obviously this is for adult, and then I try to use this screw in children as well. But in children, sometimes sometimes they are just cartilage. It's a little bit difficult to to put in the screw, and also the posterior part of the ilium is is not well developed. And it, even though they're not cartilage, they're not that 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 wide. Usually in adult in the S one S two area in this um um. The, ilia, the inner table from the SI joint to the top of the eyelid crest, and then you give you about maybe two centimeter or maybe more. And then certainly you can put a thumb and an index finger together, and then you have that space there. But in children, you don't have that. So, so, so maybe in children, sometime in this situation, go back to the S2A screw. Um, do you need to use any specialized screw uh, for this uh, 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 subcrestal eyelid screw? fixation no. and um, what is your common uh, size of the screw sure and then for this screw we don't need to use any other special screw any traditional s2 line screw ilex screw is used you can use cannulated or non-cannulated depending on what you have in your institute and um and um but one of the things i highlighted in the in the video is that you use the mis sleeve uh, that part I find is particularly useful. The minute you use the NI sleeve attached to the screw, that is a reduction device. And you can really reduce the rod into the screw and attach it quite nicely. And that is one of the key things that I would recommend uh, to use. In terms of the common size, usually nowadays, I like to use around 8.5 uh, unless I'm using a or 9.9, depending what system you're using. And... Um, and uh, or if I use a double screw, then I use a 7.5 for one and 8.5 for the, the other one. And then in terms of length, usually I aim for about 85 to 95. But again, it's not, I mean, biomechanical studies show 70 length uh, or less tends to fracture, but it's really not the length that is important. It's really the, the or the actual length. The length is important is that the screw tip should be anterior to the lumbar apex. And I think that part is the important thing to do. So depending where is your lumbar apex, then your screw should be there in order to have the cantilever moment arm for you to have the stability of the distal fixation. Hey, Gabriel, uh, do you need to uh, cut some uh, iliac bone to uh, accommodate the end of the rod if you use it as a sub character as screw? Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kaiser. Very sharp. I mean, in the video, I actually burn a little bit <laughs> of the distal end uh, in order because I can't just sing the screw a little bit just in case the screw head is still a little bit prominent. And by doing so, I tend to, uh, one, this is a screw head here. And then at the distal end, what I do is that I just burn a little bit to uh, easy for the rod to accommodate. Other than that, that's just about it. We don't actually need to recess uh, or cut an L shape or, 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 or a block out from the ilium. And this actually reduces the um, uh, ilium fracture. And this also allows you to put in the screw uh, when, pre and when the patient had previous ilium crest surgery done before. Uh, I think from the panel, there is some question from, uh, question from Dr. Srivasta. Tips to connect with proximal rod, iliac or SI screw, or separate rod as standby. Uh, any, I think maybe he meant any tips to connect the rod, or do you need uh, a connector or another separate rod? Yeah. Um. If it is for me using the subcrestal screw again, we mentioned about um using the um using the um. Uh, MIS sleeve for the screw is 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 just 
it's very easy. The minute you slide in between the MI sleeve and then you just slowly reduce it and then, then, then you will do this. Now, one of the things that you noted in the MI sleeve is that you, the MI sleeve attached to the screw head like that, right? Depending on which, which system you use, sometimes the MI sleeve is not strong enough. So for example, in the DePew system, the MI sleeve is not strong enough. Sometimes the, the sleeve will open up. So what, what we do is that we use a caucus to, to hold it in place. So to avoid it from, from opening up as you reduce the screw inside. But other systems are quite strong and then they are not too bad. But uh, that is one, one of the things that you can do. Yeah, one additional tip that I noticed in your lecture is that you put the S1 screw last so that you can line it up uh, without having uh, it, uh, what you call obstructing your rod from railing into the S. Uh, the iliac screw. Uh, Dr. Funao asked, is there any difference between male and female patients? So, so far in our experience, although the pelvic shape changes and then the dimension changes, but the, the ilium is still quite big and then so we are quite okay in this aspect. Okay, I think, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we will move on to the next speaker. Yeah. The next speaker is a, a case report uh, reported by Dr. Sharif. Uh, the topic is uh, wretched uh, kyphal scoliosis uh, deformity. So thank you, Dr. Kai. So first of all, I would also like to thank the APSS online subcommittee for organizing the first basic spine webinar. So today I'm going to present a case. So we know that we have already discussed the various fundamentals and techniques of deformity correction, specifically screw placement, freehand technique, spinal pelvic fixation, etc. So my case is basically a 28 years male. He has presented with back pain, yeah. the main problem is back pain and it hampers actually her his daily activities. Specifically, he cannot sleep in this position due to his deformity. Only thing is that he has no neurological deficit. As you can show in your uh, slide that this patient has mainly Hyphotic deformity with a little bit component of scoliosis. But if we go through the X-ray, it seems that there is a very short curve of scoliotic. It seems around 90 degree, and the kyphotic is around 84 degree. The main problem issues here are the balance as well as the pain. And in X-ray, there seems also the hemivertebra. And if we see the MRI, MRI seems normal. There is no tethering as well as no compression. But CT, what we actually see in that? This is a basically type 40 with two hemivertebra is present. Probably these two hemivertebra as the main culprit for Typhotic deformity and it is also progressive. So, based on this CT as well as the X ray, this is a case of typhoscoliotic deformity. Of course, it is a very rigid type. And country like ours, specifically where the technological advantage as well as the infrastructure is not so developed, so it is very difficult for our spine surgeon to manage. As the, you are the more expert for this type of deformity dealings. So I'm, I'm asking all of you, so based on this scenario, what should we do to manage this case? And what is the ideal approach? And how can we avoid complication? Thank you. Yeah, so maybe we can ask uh, the panel to uh, maybe discuss this case uh, live. Is there anyone? Uh, 
maybe um, can I ask uh, Professor Gabriel, do you have any comments uh, or questions? Uh, sorry, your mic is mute. Thanks, um, um, uh, Dr. Jonah. Very challenging case, very scary cases. And then, uh, and then looking at the patients. Um, uh, we don't have so many of these deformity type of cases in Singapore, but what, one of the approach that I would have done is that uh, two things. Probably, I would probably uh, try to... Does the patient have neurological deficit? No, no. This patient has okay. no neurological deficit. One is the back pain is the main issue. Right, right. They cannot right. sleep in... I mean, the... Position, right. position. That is and the concern. I see. So the back pain is usually because of the deformity, and then the apex allow him the, do not allow him to lie flat, and yeah. then the, and make the skin a little bit thin, and then the uh because of the kyphosis and leaning forward, the muscle have to work harder, therefore leading to f uh, muscle fatigue pain in this situation. Um. So um. What what I would think is that probably because it's a slightly progressing deformity, and then I would probably uh, offer surgery, and then I probably reduce a little bit of the kyphosis. My my approach is usually a posterior approach, and then I would probably uh, reduce some sort of kyphosis over that area. At the moment, for the initial glance, um, before I actually talk about what I'm going to do, what, the things that I get scared is, is the first one is that when I straighten the spine or reduce the spine, that uh, the, 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 the patient become paralyzed. And because correcting the kyphosis in a, in a, in a sick so uh, thoracic cord is very scary. And also sometimes because this is around the clonus area, even though the spinal cord monitoring may not show, but the gradual stretching of the cord may also leading to some of the problem subsequently that may not be picked up to a certain extent. So to me, the first thing is that I'm, I might not want to correct everything in this particular situation and I'll just reduce it a little bit and that's basically what I wanted to do. So with that in mind, my, my strategy will be a stable fixation above and below, probably three level ups and then maybe two level down with a hook or three level down depending on the purchase. And the, the, there's three hemivertebrate there just, or abnormal vertebrate there. I would probably just take the apical one and then by doing so, reduce some of the kyphosis. And then the level above and below, I would put pointy osteotomy to smoothen the correction, to, to make a bit of release and uh, to do. So for example, if you look at the CT scan and you look at the X-ray and then on the, on the spine and then on the, on, the, on the MRI scan, actually that alignment is not too bad. I mean, this to a certain extent, there is a, the, the ky kyphus can reduce a little bit. And then so if I can maintain this kyphus, we just take away the, the apex and then connecting it and then with a good uh, uh, bone graft support in between that I might do. But in the surgery, you will realize the patient is stable a little bit then I might take a little bit of M plate from the lower end and then to uh, do an extended osteotomy um, or extended PVCR and then to do so. But I would uh, I, I'm worried about uh, over correcting this thing and leading to um, uh, actual actuogenic spinal cord uh, uh, damage. Uh, some other things that we'll do is that during the the the, the reduction maneuver then I will make sure the butt pressure is around 85 and then um, a mean, mean arterial blood pressure 85. And then I would actually give some steroid before I do anything. And then before I do so, and obviously when I do this thing, I want to make sure the HP is not dropped to eight or seven or six or anything like that. And then before I attempt to do the reduction. And of course we have continuous spinal cord monitoring and frequent NEP uh, uh, review in order to make sure uh, uh, everything is okay. But at the end of the day, might, might even need to do a wake up test uh, before you close up. The reason why, because as we mentioned about the general stretching of the spinal cord, sometimes the MEP, SSCP may not pick up so quickly. Uh, that is my, my thought at this point of time. Thank you very much for sharing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Gabriel. Um, anyone, in, anyone else in the panel would like to comment or ask any question? Um, uh, Dr. Yu Yamato, do you have any comments on this? Uh, this patient has no 
neurological deficit. So how, how was the uh, status of the spinal cord at the high force site? Uh, um, Dr. Jonai, yes. how yes. is the status of the spinal cord at this site? Uh, for... So actually the patient has no neurological deficit. Com compressed? Compressed? Comp uh, it seems that there is little bit compression because my main thing concern here is the only, I mean the hemivertebra as well as the kyphotic deformity. That is the main thing issues here. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, yeah, do, do you have any MRI slices uh, at the kyphotic area? I have MRI so many slides, but that uh, is not included. And all the scan shows there is not so much core compression. Okay, so there is no compression at the kyphotic side. Mm -hmm. It's just impinging, impinging, but not so much compression. Um, I, I have a question. And then, um, as, as we say, we, we have limited experience for this congenital abnormality. I'm just wondering, since you have a lot of experience and also our India co Indian co uh, colleague, Ajoy, may have a lot of experience as well, Vishal. And then, uh, would, would traction... Can traction reduce the, the, the some of this deformity a little bit in this congenital hemivertebrae in your experience? Anyone have this experience? Yes, that is a very good question. So in such cases, suppose if there is rigid or like these cases, sometimes we have to use the traction, specifically if we use in that case a posterior release and apply the traction, that would, uh, I mean the that will help us to make the surgery easier. But for this particular case, actually, we did not apply any traction. We do it in a single stage. But traction is also a good alternative for this type of deformity correction. So anyone comments from others? Yeah, side? maybe we can ask uh, Dr. Srivasta. Uh, yeah, we have uh, some suggestions on this case. Yeah. So uh, very good afternoon. Actually, this is similar to the healed severe kyphosis in tuberculosis, which we get uh, in uh, Asian countries. So the step is same as Professor Gabriel has rightly mentioned. You have three level above anchor and three level, level below anchor. And you one has to do the uh, you know, posterior recia. And you have to have a very controlled uh, correction. Usually, yes. we the uh, posterior shortening and anterior uh, control, you know, distraction, and then you get a good correction. As far as the traction, uh, hello, uh, pelvic traction is uh, concerned, the, usually the apex is very rigid, and whatever mild correction you get, it is just proximal and distal compensatory cost, not the main apex. The main apex will require surgical correction. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank, uh, thank you. Uh, maybe uh, can you show us what is done for this case? So what we have done is suppose a single stress posterior vertebral column resection. So first of all, we would apply three level above and three level below, uh, four level below the screws. Then we use a temporary roll. So after that, we did the, did the laminectomy as well as starting the this year, that is the vertebral column resection, and try to correct gradually by changing the rod. The most important thing is that here, as the kyphosis is so much obvious, so in that case, we use a short rod and try to correct it gradually. And first of all, we would apply a, I mean the cylindrical cage or mesh cage, and it acts as a fulcrum, so that the cage is placed in the anterior part, and we tried to correct by changing the rod gradually, and compression the posterior side. And this is the diagrammatic picture you can show here. And this is the final correction. So you can see here, so by doing this, we are able to do the correction with a very good alignment. And this is the final outcome. 
So in conclusion, I would like to say that though this type of rigid deformity is a very challenging case, but can be done safely with patients. And you have to be very careful regarding handling this case. So you need also experience as well as patients. Thank you. Thank you for giving me opportunity to that case. Um, from uh, is there any questions on what was done uh, from the panel or anyone, uh, the faculty as well? I have. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Banu, yes. I, I have one question for you. A very good correction with me uh, performed, a very excellent. How about the interoperative uh, neural monitoring? So, unfortunately, there are places where I did it not equipped with neuromonitoring. So basically we have to live with our experience, but it should not be done without neuromonitoring. Now, good thing is that now my center has equipped with neuromonitoring that gives us more, make the jobs easier. Maybe I can follow on the questions on that. Um, uh, Dr. Bano, since you are asking this, this, these questions, if during the surgery, there's some unstable signal and unstable MEP, SSCP and things like that, when would you continue? When would you stop? When would you, when would you take it seriously? Because the, the, the spinal cord is quite sick and it's quite unstable in terms of monitoring. So this is a very good question. If it is seen that all the MEP as well as SSCP is seen that very low, that means those no signal at all, so I mean, in that case, we have to stop the procedure. I have, uh, first of all, I have to do the very low high dose steroid as well as the curvature. That is, I, you know, I have already put the rod. Maybe it should be loosened and try to observe. If it seems that the signal is improving, that I, may, I might be continued. If it is seen that there is no changes the signal at that time, so maybe uh, I should just do it as the procedure that I have already done in the in situ like that position. So what do you think? Do you defer this opinion or you have any thoughts? Anyone? Uh, I think Dr. Funao, uh, you have a question. Thank you for uh, excellent uh, surgery. Uh, I'm very impressed. So, so which vertebra uh, did you take off? Uh, I might miss, uh, just T11 or just one or two or three? Actually, I did the two hemivertebrae section. Two hemivertebrae? Two hemivertebrae, the epical, epical. Did you sacrifice the thoracic nabur? Uh, in the convex side, I have to sacrifice. Hmm. Any complaint uh, from No, the no, patient? because it was probably T10, so it's okay. not. Sometimes only the, one, only yeah, one. Yeah, abdominal wall, uh, pseudo hernia or something. Abdominal wall is some, uh, kind of uh, bulging. No, maybe not. So because the thoracic lower thoracic spine, that if they sacrifice the the, the T eleven or T T ten or T eleven, then some patient complaint of the uh, abdominal wall bulging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that. Hmm. Only this question I did not observe. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Anyway. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think uh, we will move on to the next uh, speaker. Uh, the next speaker uh, is Dr. Shah. Uh, he will be talking on challenges and diagnostic dilemmas in management of kyphotic deformity in an adolescent girl. Good afternoon, respected persons and dear faculty members. First of all, I'm really thankful to APSS for providing me this opportunity. I'm going to present my case regarding challenges and diagnostic dilemma in the management of post traumatic kyphotic deformity in an adolescent girl. So, Slide is not. 
प्रॉब्लम थैंक यू तो विदाउट मशी एज वी ऑल नो थ्रैको लंबा फ्रैक्चर चेंजेस बायो मैकेनिक्स ऑफ इट्स फाइन the loss of height in the vertebral body and disruption of posterior tension mesh may lead to the kyphosis of the spine the existing kyphosis may progress to the load on the mba column and may lead to sagittal imbalance progressive kyphosis and sagittal imbalance may result in back pain and may cause late onset illogical deficit in my case i have a uh, i had a 24 year old female she had a st of fall of roof over her 7 months back and she was managed conservatively at a rural health center she was advised bed rest for 2 months following trauma patient was allowed to gradual weight bearing and walk free after the 3 months patient observed progressive back pain and deformity despite of the conservative treatment then this patient was referred to our center for the treatment of spinal deformity here is the patient on examination patient has the kyphotic deformity over the back but neurological examination revealed normal neurology There was no neurological deviation. Regarding the gait, patient is walking with a stoop posture, as we see, and this uh, deformity is progressive. And presently, patient is also having difficulty in lying down, even on the sleeping. So she was referred to us for the treatment of this deformity. Here are the X-rays for this patient. As we see, there is a subtle fracture of the T12 vertebra in the, this uh, uh, lumbosacral spine X-ray. While uh, these are the uh, lying down X-rays. in this thoracolumbar spine x ray we see this uh, there is sagittal imbalance for this patient and uh, which is further aggravated on uh, on seeing this standing x ray there is a marked sagittal imbalance in this patient on measurement uh, the local kyphotic deformity is around 40 degree while the sagittal index was 40 the lumbar lordosis was reversed changes into the kyphotic deformity of 36 degree while the whole kyphotic deformity in this patient was around 80 degree so now my case is open for discussion is it post traumatic or really or something i am missing because this deformity is uh, looking to be a global and uh, regarding the management what should be the approach and level of fixation and what are the manners to correct such kyphosis and what are the surgical challenges that we can observe in uh, such kind of deformity correction yeah um any any questions or any comments from the panel um maybe uh yes dr srivasta taba uh your mic is muted yeah yeah this doesn't appear to be uh, you know this deformity because of a single level wedge fracture this doesn't happen so this is a regular kyphotic deformity which usually we see in cervical kyphosis it is similar to that but if you see the x ray of her si joint there is sclerosis in that area so there is there should be something else also and we have to investigate uh, regarding uh, this the management should be according to the you know round kyphosis what we uh, manage you know so you will have to do the multiple level either posterior ponte or sometimes what we used to do earlier there may be at multiple level you do anterior opening to correct the kyphotic deformity so this is just a history and uh, which is uh, uh, you know directing us towards post traumatic so this is not a simple post traumatic there might be one which there at that time but the etiology is not because of that single level the severe in a round kyphosis that's what i think can can uh, may i know uh, the the do you uh, check the the C, crp and the esr and the hlb 27 yes so all were normal we try to find out all other causes as per the sherman there is a like a, there is a, in this case there is only a single vertebra is involved so we are also thinking about the sherman disease but we tried to find out other reason but we are not able to get so hlb 27 like angst point there is no, there's no uh, other symptoms of angst point in other disease in this case um and maybe i is giving history of only 7 7 months that is and this deformity is progressive 
Um, maybe can I ask uh, Prof. Chris, uh, do you have any comments on this uh, case or any questions to the presenter? Yeah, I, I think that um, I agree with the rest of the panel that this is not a post-traumatic kyphosis because uh, post-traumatic kyphosis will lead to an acute angular deformity with a compensatory mechanism above and below the fracture. So like what we see here, the deformity is very gradual. It's a very long segment. And we see mainly the deformity is over the thoraco lumbar junction as well as loss of uh, lumbar low disease. So we, when we see a very pronounced uh, anterior translation leading to a very big sagittal vertical axis, a lot of times it is due to a lumbar deformity. So, so the thing is that uh, this deformity arises uh, with a very big SVA, mainly because of the loss of the lumbar lordosis. And I think that at this moment, we still do not know what is the cause, but like what Dr. Ajoy mentioned or Dr. Kai Chao mentioned, uh, we need to check to make sure that we are not dealing with the ankylosing spondylitis because ankylosing spondylitis is one of the more common conditions which lead to loss of uh, lumbar lordosis. Uh, whether it's Sherman's kyphosis, uh, I do not see uh, multiple levels of uh, wedge vertebra, so uh, I cannot tell whether it is a uh, a type of uh, or variant of uh, thoracolumbar Sherman's uh, disease. Uh, that is my comment. So I think at the moment, we still need to check to find out what is the diagnosis in this case. Yeah, just to follow up on the, those comments, uh, do you have uh, any uh, pre-traumatic x-rays of the patient or do you ask about uh, her history, you know, uh, whether her friends or her relatives or her family members notice that she's a bit hunched uh, uh, if prior to the ex, uh, the trauma. Yeah. Yes, sir. We ask about this thing. Uh, we were very eager with the findings in this patient. So we ask uh, in the history. But, but the patient and patient attendant gave the same history. The patient was fine and this deformity is getting progressive. So we are not sure about that. Then we thought that might be some variant of Sherman disease or something that you must be having initially because this deformity doesn't happen with a simple post-traumatic single wedge fracture. Did, we were not uh, um, doctor, that's also confusing in this case. That's why I was just presenting this case. Uh, Dr. Shah, do you have any better view of the sacroiliac joint or do you have a CD scan to allow us to better appreciate uh, the bony right anatomy? Now, right now, I don't have. But SI joints were normal. So this, uh, this one, this seems to be a bit uh, involved. But uh, she doesn't have any problem with the SI joint and uh, all those. Clinically, she doesn't have. And MRI was also normal. There was no compression at all. Right now, I'm not included in this one, but I'm I was absolutely normal. So, is there any neuromuscular component? I mean, like, do you have any chest x or like that? Yeah, we did, yeah, we did EMG for this patient, but that was uh, doesn't come out to be fruitful. We did not get anything with that EMG also. We were uh, any any CD scan? Do you have a CD yeah. scan? Right now, I have not had CT scan, but uh, there was no abnormal finding in the CT and MRI. So that's why I didn't put here. And there was not at all any compression. The neurology was normal to this patient. All right. Um, maybe can you tell us what you have done or what diagnosis you have uh, uh, finally got to? Yeah. Okay, sir. So what was done in this case uh, that uh, the Dr. Shivasa said already told us that uh, we have managed because we thought it to be a variant of Sherman disease that uh, because it was having only single wedge vertebra. So we kept uh, on the basis on the same line, like the long global deformity. Man we managed this patient on the, on the basis of global deformity. Like a uh, patient was managed by long segment fixation from P4 to L3 with multiple quantities of slotting around the apex. So this patient was taken under general anesthesia under intraoperative neuron monitoring with all necessary precautions. And uh, after the exposure, the uh, stools were fixed on both sides. And on fixing from one side, then we did multiple pontes osteotomy. Then these pontes osteotomy were closed. And the manual that I have employed uh, for correction of such deformity uh, is the uh, cantilever mechanism and in situ rod bending. Then after checking the screw sizes in on fluoroscopy and uh, seeing uh, all uh, interoperative neurology with the neural monitoring, then we did closure in layers along with the bone grafting to hasten up the fusion. Here's a post-op x-ray for this patient. 
and from pre or clinical pick to this uh, clinical pick at the time of discharge here the pre op uh, uh, walking gait as compared to the post op walking gait and this post op walking gait uh, this video was taken at the time of discharge for this patient patient was not having a back pain right now so so take home message from my case is a surgical treatment of post traumatic arthrosis can be done via either posterior or anterior combined approaches posterior approach is desirable as it is associated with less blood loss and reduce surgical time however the kyphotic angle for the surgical decision and fusion level are still controversial the most important thing is the global sagittal imbalance that should be taken into consideration for considering the such deformity thanks a lot sir for your presentation sir Uh, thank you a lot for sharing. Uh, is there any comments from the panel? Uh, anyone uh, from the faculty as well? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Doctor Yu Yamato. Yeah. You have some comment. Yeah. Thank. Thank you for very very good result. Very good correction. Uh, Could you tell us uh, uh, findings, interoperative findings, for example, facet to joint? Findings, okay. interoperative. Yes, interoperative findings. Interoperative findings. So it was yeah. just like uh, there was nothing abnormal uh, in this. Uh, we we managed with like a sim simple exposure, and uh, we we didn't get anything extra like uh, any other abnormal findings. Oh, yeah. So particularly, more. maybe the facet joint. Uh, uh, any particular changes in the facet joint intraoperatively? No, yeah. sir. Sorry. No. Nothing abnormal. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I see. So we still were not uh, uh, certain about the diagnosis, but I've gone through the literature. Then uh, the paper says that the World Federation of Surgical they say that there are two type of deformities of the after the post trauma. So in one we can get a global sagittal imbalance. And similar kind of that we can get, but there was one paper only, so I was not sure about the diagnosis. So we thought it after discussing with my seniors, then they said it probably might be a variant of Schwerman disease that got aggravated after the history of trauma. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. If there is no other questions, uh, I think uh, we will bring the webinar to the end. Um. We would like to invite uh, is uh, Dr. Vishal here to to close. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Vishal. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, so I think I think uh, since you have been moderating, I would request you to please provide the summary statement before I go for the vote of thanks for faculty. Chief. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and Dr. Kai Chao, I I will start first. Uh, thank you very much. I think um this webinar generally want to uh um approach uh on uh, on topics on uh, the basic fixation methods and basic management of uh, spine deformity. And I think I hope that uh we has achieved its target to some extent. And uh, I would like to thank all the uh, speakers uh, for for their contribution. Uh, in their topics, in their expertise, and also the case presenters uh, who have shared uh, valuable cases in their experience. Yeah. Uh, Doctor Kai Chao, do you have anything to uh, close? So, uh, yes, it's, uh, thank you very much for uh, for the, the everybody the the the, the panels and uh, the case report uh, the doctors share the case reporters and uh, I think it's a uh, it's a great uh, webinar for us and i uh, i hope to uh, to see you uh, later the next time thank you thank you kai Chao, and thank you chief for conducting this webinar so very well it has been a great interactive session and i'm sure the the drive home message was very loud and clear in fact it's a matter of pride and honor for me in particular because i have all my teachers here dr sudhi shrivastava sir from kem mumbai Who's an integral part of the online education committee? Thank you so much, sir, for joining us here, Dr. Ajoy Shetty, who's again a very, very close dear friend, colleague, and senior teacher to me, who, from whom we have been learning the intrigues of basics in spine. Dr. Ajoy Shetty is also the chairman of education committee of Asia Pacific Spine Society. Prof. Gabriel, 
who himself under whom I have done my uh, fellowship in spine surgery at Singapore. Thank you so much, Prof. Gabriel, for joining us here and uh, helping us to learn more and more on this. Also, I like to outset uh, thank all my faculty members, uh, Dr. Bano, Dr. Funa from Japan, Dr. Yamato from Japan, uh, Dr. Chris, a very close friend of mine whom we saw in 2020 in India, Dr. Gabriel Liu, Dr. Sharif Zonayat from Bangladesh, Dr. Shah Waliullah from India. I really thank you all for contributing to this great webinar. And I look forward to your contributions in coming webinar series in, in coming times as well. Uh, Asia Pacific Spine Society strives to help everyone who wants to learn uh, spine and the nuances of spine surgery in future also. And this is only a beginning of the online webinar series. We'll continue doing so with uh, three more uh, advanced level webinars in this year and two more basic level uh, webinars in this year. And I look forward to you all to join us and contribute towards the learning for all the delegates who are joining us from various parts of the continents and Asia Pacific. Thank you again, all of you for joining us. Thank you, Prof. Kwan, for blessing us and motivating us to continue being a part of the online webinar series. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh... <laughs>